one seconds. Just to check other members whether they are joined or not. So Rajiv. Yeah, Rajiv. Rajiv has joined, sir. Yes, shall we start the program, sir? Yes, yes. Yeah, Rajiv. Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, all to all our audience. So we have almost 15 participants and we'll start for the evening. Uh, the first workshop uh, in the workshop series 2023 on building inclusive cities for a resilient and sustainable future uh, organized by School of Planning and Architecture Vijayawada in collaboration with UN Habitat. Uh, the topic for the fifth uh, workshop is urban design and resilient development. And we have two eminent speakers with us. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Yaseen, uh, the urban planning expert from UN Habitat with us. Uh, hello, sir. And uh, we have our second speaker for the day, Dr. Srinivas uh, Dakete, the assistant professor, Department of Architecture, School of Planning and Architecture. Welcome, you, sir. Uh, and the chief patron for this uh, web workshop series is uh, our director uh, of School of Planning and Architecture, Vijayawada, Professor Dr. Ramesh Srikonda. Welcome, you, sir. Uh, so uh, we'll, without any delay, we'll start off with our workshop uh, series and discussions. And uh, with that, I welcome the coordinator, uh, Dr. Adi Narayan, the Dean Planning and Development and Head Department of Planning to give the welcome address. Sir, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Rajiv. Uh, respected Director, Professor Dr. Ramesh Rikonda, sir, Ms. Paru Lagarwala, and Ms. Mansi Sachidev from UN Habitat team, and Mr. Today's uh, uh, ex expert speakers from UN Habitat team, Mr. Yasin, and uh, the second speaker, Dr. Shin Was from Department of Architecture, School of Planning and Architecture, Vijayawada. All deans, HODs, and dear participants, uh, I welcome you all for this uh, even Habitat and the SPAB collaborated workshop series. As of now, the SPAB Jayawada, in collaboration with uh, even Habitat, have successfully conducted uh, four workshops out of 10 workshops scheduled for this academic year. We have received a tremendous response and this workshop series helps to gain advanced knowledge and exposure to planning and architecture fraternity. Further, workshop lectures were live streamed and disseminated to the other MOU partner institutions of international and Indian universities of SPL Jayavada. So with this uh, brief welcome note, I once again welcome you all. I hope this workshop will be beneficial to the participants. Best of luck. Now I request Rajiv, Mr. Rajiv, to introduce the external expert from UN Habitat team, Mr. Yasin. Uh, thank thank you. you, sir. Uh, so uh, we will start with the workshop then. Uh, so that's Rajiv, a... Before that, yes. uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, I'll address call our director uh, for welcome address. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, thank you. So uh, now we'll move on to our inaugural address from the chief patron of this workshop series on building inclusive cities for resilient and sustainable future. Our uh, director of SP Vijayawada, Professor Dr. Ramesh Srikonda. So welcome you for the uh, giving the inaugural. Thank you, Mr. Rajiv. Good afternoon to all uh, distinguished experts from the United Nations Human Settlement Program, Ms. Parul Akarawan, Country Program Manager, Ms. Mansi Sachdev, Senior Urban Planner, respected speakers, Mr. Yansi, Urban Planner, expert from UN Habitat Kenya, and Dr. Srinivas, Assistant Professor, Department of Architecture, School of Planning and Architecture, Deans, HODs, faculty members, and my dear students. Greetings to each one of you present here. I am delighted to be present here today and to inaugurate and chair the opening ceremony for workshop series on building inclusive cities for resilient and sustainable future. 
This fifth workshop under the theme, especially, that is urban design and resilient development. If you look at it, incredibly, over half of humanity already live in urban settings. With this figure projected to rise to two thirds by 2050, the need for development action in the cities can no longer be overlooked. Urban resilience, especially the ability of the cities dwellers to withstand economic, social, health, environmental, and disaster and climatic related risks has assumed to review and has become a central to our development and disclosure. More than even before, a magnitude, if you look at, of different risks are manifesting themselves with a higher frequency, greater magnitude, and cascading effects in the cities of what we are experiencing nowadays. Accordingly, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, nearly 84% of the fastest growing cities face extreme climate and disaster risk. And then when you look at it, the discouraging scenario is compounded by the location of many high-risk cities is challenging development context, such as at least by the location of many high-risk areas. Then really we have to look at in the low-income countries and small islands, developing states, coupled with the consideration of the governance deficits and structural changes in what we can able to bring it. When you look at that increasing of urbanization risk is making us to be more systematic with cascading impacts across all walks of our life, interdependent sector support, really the development, what, how we have to look at it. It has become one of the essential thing for us. Recognizing this kind of, this is a, as an imperative if you look at it, it is inevitable to transform our development approaches by mutually reinforcing investment in structural transformation, addressing the needs of the poor, and marginalized especially to ensure that no one is left behind. That's the one important task we have to see in this particular program. And ensuring resilience to interesting and systematic risks and foster a sustainable development. I wish you all present here for today's interesting and beneficial session. Thank you once again. Now I request Mr. Rajiv, Assistant Professor, to take over and give the introduction of our present day speakers, eminent speakers, Mr. Kiasi. Then I think Mr. Rajiv, please take over and give the about our expert speaker. Then we will go ahead and with the program. Thank you very much, one and all. Thank you for the words, sir. Uh, we'll move on. We'll I would take I take this opportunity to introduce our expert speaker, uh, the first expert speaker for the day, uh, Mr. Yassin. Uh, sir is an urban planning expert at the UN Habitat, uh, and he has worked extensively on the challenges of urbanization with the Middle East and North African region, West Africa, and Southeast Asia and has actively participated in a variety of projects focusing on inter integrated urban planning, housing, green infrastructure, metropolitan urbanization, and urban rural linkages. Uh, prior to the joining the UN Habitat, uh, Mr. Yassin has lectured at the Institute of International Urbanism, uh, University of Stuttgart, Germany. And he has also worked as a project coordinator with the International Research Program, Future Megacities, energy and climate efficient structures in urban growth centers, funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. Uh, Mr. Yassin holds a master's degree in architecture from the Ecole uh, National Architecture, Rabat and Tonjin University, Shanghai, as well as a master's degree in urban design from the Technical University of Berlin. Uh, he is a PhD candidate working on the topic of cross-border urban governance in Singapore, Johor uh, Riau uh, Extended Urban Region. With that uh, short introduction to his vast years of experience, uh, we welcome you, sir, to give your first session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm uh, very, very glad to be with you today. 
um, to uh, share with you some of our experience uh, regarding resilience. I am just try to share my screen and you tell me um, if it works. Um, Here. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, sir. We are able to see your screen. Yes, yes. All right. Perfect. It is clear. Can I just, yes, yes. Okay. Then I just go to my presentation. All right. Yeah, well, thank you for inviting uh, for inviting us. Um, um, today I will be mainly talking um, about um, our approach uh, to resilience, uh, looking at a specific project in Tajikistan, in Khurok, um, which we call Integrated Spatial Plan for Environmental and Social so, uh, Socioeconomic Resilience. Um, it, it's quite funny that we're talking about resilience today uh, because we're going through a terrible heat wave in this part of the world. Um, and uh, it's just, uh, I myself need to be resilient uh, while doing this presentation to survive it. Um, but anyways, I mean, the, the, the history of humankind has been uh, kind of a story of, of uh, survival and resilience and coping with our vulnerabilities. Um, and what I'm showing you today is not to scare you, but just a map that shows all uh, or some of the, the, the risks um, uh, that that the world is is facing from earthquakes, from tropical uh, cyclones, from volcanoes, climate impacts, um, even conflict, um, uh, and these um, uh, these uh, risks they also overlap in many areas of the world. Um, what is also uh, quite um, obvious um, is that resilience have become an urban topic. Uh, because it happens that many of our cities are actually the hotspots of um, uh, risks and vulnerabilities around the world. And these are places where there are millions of, of people living uh, and exposed to all kinds of, um, um, of, of risks, but also ramifications of, of disasters and, and hazards. And as you see here, these are kind of mainly all mega cities around the world or most of the mega cities around the world are somehow exposed at least to one kind of, of hazard um, or risk. Um, before I go into the project, I kind of uh, agreed to uh, draw a framework uh, for our discussion today about, about resilience, where it comes from, um, and kind of just to be on the, on the same page. Um, it's good to know that the, the term resilience itself is not, a, is not uh, coming from the urban field. Uh, it's mainly uh, coming from the field of psychology, military and engineering. But um, it wasn't until recently that it, it gained prominence um, in, uh, in urban development uh, to look at the various complex challenges of, of urbanization. Um, and what, what is different uh, what, what resilience comes uh, with in, in terms of, of or adds uh, in terms of value um, is difference to risk assessments, which only looks at the risks that we know, while resilience uh, tries to highlight the unknown risks and the complexity of, of a system with possible cascading threats um, and uh, domino effects. Um, um, also, um, uh, the uh, uh, the term resilience now is adopted in, in many international and global agendas, like the uh, new urban agenda, uh, which really puts resilience in the core of urban development around the world. Um, and also we have to understand now that we are living in a complex and dynamically adaptive system that actually needs to integrate uh, uh, the, the, the concept of resilience to look and, at the, the urban systems and try to reduce their vulnerability. Um, resilience itself uh, is, is a paradigm shift in terms of thinking uh, because it moves from the idea of, okay, we're gonna control risk 
uh, uh, to uh, kind of another approach to see how we can strengthen our ability to cope with known and unknown risks. Um, the example of the pandemic was 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 quite obvious that uh, um, we were facing something new, and some countries were able to cope with, with it uh, uh, better than others or differently than others. Um, so it was kind of an unknown uh, risk that the cities and countries have to adapt to um, and, and show their resilience to it. Um, there are kind of two schools of thinking about resilience. There's the, the resilience uh, that, that tries to bounce back uh, from, uh, from uh, a shock, yeah? uh, trying to go back to, to, the, to the initial uh, status. So if an infrastructure is destroyed, or um, uh, then we try to rebuild it um, or restore it to go back to the uh, initial phase um, or the state, while the other school of thinking or the other pers uh, perspective uh, of resilience uh, looks at the transformative um, uh, forces that can come with shocks, that we are not only trying to go back to the initial phase, but we're trying to actually take that as an opportunity to transform uh, the system and, and, and look at alternative ways uh, to, to adapt. Um, it also gives you the opportunity to address inequality, vulnerabilities, um, and uh, develop adaptive capacities for uh, for cities. This is just kind of a graph that um, summarizes what I was uh, talking about, this approach of uh, what happens after a disruption. Are we trying to absorb and recover and then continue with the same uh, with business as usual? or we're trying to change or adapt um, our, our uh, way of living, our way of building um, and, and perceiving uh, and, and conceiving cities uh, differently uh, to be also more resilient to future risks. Um, there are also different domains to resilience. It's not only about infrastructure, it's not always physical. Um, there are mainly four domains of, of resilience that are quite um, uh, interesting also in the case of, of cities. There is a physical one, um, which we all know about, infrastructure buildings, um, uh, equipment, um, which can also be, be vulnerable to different uh, risks uh, from natural hazards to terror attacks. There is information resilience. Um, uh, which is something that we start to see now um, or more recently about the creation and the manipulation of data um, and how states also and cities can be vulnerable to uh, uh, attacks or to digital attacks. Uh, a very important domain which is usually uh, overlooked is the co cognitive uh, resilience, which is the ability of, of the population uh, to understand uh, uh, the, their, their values, their biases, and how they um, have an impact on resilience and vulnerability. And this is something we also observed during the pandemic. Uh, for example, the rejection of um, many uh, people uh, or many people rejecting vaccination roles because of uh, uh, certain uh, uh, kind of uh, understanding or perception of the issue. And then there is the social uh, resilience, a very crucial one that is taking uh, more importance now in the field of urban development. Um, social resilience looks at the, uh, uh, the ability um, of, of people to collaborate and to self-organize um, in uh, facing, uh, when facing a shock. Um, and that also includes the lack of <laughs> trust uh, uh, and its impact like between people and their governance, for example, uh, government, um, or just their ability to uh, collaborate. Um, and then there are also different approaches to, to resilience, and that comes also with political uh, or policy implications. Uh, we have disaster resilience, 
um, usually short term focused on one disaster or a few disasters uh, and focusing on, on uh, critical infrastructure. Um, uh, there is the engineering resilience, uh, which focuses on quick recovery, reconstruction, restoring uh, it, uh, damaged um, infrastructure, which actually goes back to our, uh, uh, to what, what I just explained as the concept of bouncing back. Uh, there's the ecological resilience, um, which actually looks at uh, urban system functionalities in an integral way um, and aims at um, stabilizing the system, trying to keep it as stable as possible as in an ecological or biological system. Uh, there's a socio-ecological resilience, uh, which is uh, the capacity to to self-organize, uh, collaborative action. Um, the difficulty with that is that it's very difficult to know where is the cause and where is the effect. How can you uh, uh, measure uh, social uh, resilience? Um, and there's the evolutionary resilience, which again goes back to the notion of bouncing forward, uh, trying to change the system. Um, um, but that actually requires a lot of political will. I give again an example of the pandemic. Um, the the most of the airline companies were uh, uh, very badly hurt by by the pandemic, and then you see a lot of states actually putting money to keep the companies uh, alive, uh, instead of thinking of taking that opportunity to th to think of alternative ways uh, to sustainable uh, transportation. Um, there are also challenges to urban resilience. One of them is. Um, conflicting interpretations of how we uh, implement resilience, both spatially and, and socially. Um, there is, again, the notion of bouncing back that uh, does not uh, make policymakers to see the opportunity to change. Um, there is also the issue of short-term solutions that actually might threaten long-term survival. Um, um, also, the, 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 the approach of bouncing back actually can only be uh, accessible to certain uh, stratas of the population uh, and can actually increase inequalities. When a city is, is, is damaged or infrastructure is damaged, there are priorities and usually the excluded neighborhoods or the excluded areas uh, actually uh, remain actually even more excluded because most of the money goes to uh, priority areas. Um, and again, the question of how to measure measure re resilience. Um, um, so I, and then there's the question of, of, of governance, of course, of how, uh, what are the, the political challenges about um, multi-level governance, uh, how, how the institutions collaborate, whether there's complementarity between the different uh, sectoral uh, strategies. All right, if you, I don't know if you have any questions, uh, you let me know because now I will go to the, the, the project. There are many slides, so I try to go as fast as possible. I just try to take you through a, a very uh, uh, complex approach that we followed to, to cover all these uh, challenges and gaps that I've uh, just mentioned. Um, so you tell me if, um, if there are no questions, I can just continue. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Yazin, uh, 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 please go ahead. Actually, uh, we will have a question and answer session okay. at the end. So All right. please go ahead with your presentation. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, um, so we're, now we're, we're moving to Korog, to Tajikistan. Um, Korog is a small town. Uh, uh, in, it's kind of a, in a mountainous city um, in the uh, southeast of, um, or the east of Tajikistan, southeast of Tajikistan. Uh, Tajikistan is, is, is a big country, but uh, with a small population. Uh, uh, it's around 9.3 million inhabitants. Um, most of it is uh, still rural. Um, Khorog itself, is part of or the capital of the Jibao um, uh, region, which is an autonomous region. Um, it takes 40% uh, 
of the territory, of the national territory, but only has 2% of the population. It's mainly a mountainous area, uh, which uh, actually facing different challenges that we're going to go through later. Khorog itself is, a, as I said, is a small town of around 30,000 inhabitants. Um, very high unemployment rate, around kind of 30 to 40%. Um, uh, very low population growth, uh, mainly because of uh, migration. Uh, people leaving the city because of all the challenges that it's facing. Um, so as you see, um, it's kind of squeezed between two mountains, mountains um, and crossed by, by a river. Um, this is just to give you some idea about how the city looks like. Um, quite picturesque. Uh, uh, what you see on the left is um, the mountains on the left of the uh, river is Afghanistan. So it's a border, it's a border town as well. Um, it's also characterized by very uh, interesting local architecture. Um, it's called like a Pamiri, Pamiri architecture. Um, but it also uh, faces or has been facing a huge decline in terms of infrastructure, in terms of industry, um, and also um, very radical urban transformation. Um, looking at the new development that is happening now, in an earthquake prone area, we start to see towers of uh, 12 to 13 uh, floors um, that actually don't really fit to the geography of the region. Um, this is just a compar comparison of the region, Jibao, uh, to other uh, countries, um, uh, neighboring Tajikistan. And you can see that this region actually is ranking extremely high when it comes to risk. Uh, Khorog itself is facing um, earthquake risks, avalanches, rock falls, landslides, floods, climate change, conflict. <laughs> uh, so if there is, uh, I don't know if there is any other uh, city that has all this catalog of, uh, of, of risks, but what is even, um, what makes the situation even more uh, difficult is the ramifications of the disasters. Um, that we see an increased socioeconomic vulnerability, disruption of vital infrastructure that is already aging, uh, disruption of food supply, because usually when it snows in winter, the roads are blocked, uh, disruption of houses, destruction of houses and social facilities, lack of investment. Uh, so no one is interested to come and invest in, in, a, um, uh, in a, a kind of dangerous place. Um, and uh, mass migration of the youth towards other cities in the region. Um, this is, I'm, I'm starting with our, with the UN Habitat, with the urban lab approach of how we um, uh, kind of start or perceive, uh, or start with a project or approach a project. Um, this is what we call the wiggly line because the, the road to planning is never straightforward. Um, and it has mainly three, uh, three phases. Um, the first phase is understanding the city, which is mainly about data collection, evidence base, uh, uh, spatial analysis, assessments, um, uh, workshops, uh, community workshops. Um, then the second phase is more about planning the city, about developing strategic responses to uh, what was diagnosed, um, uh, testing and developing and testing scenarios. Um, and then we move to transformation, uh, transforming the city, uh, which actually looks at the implementability of the pro of the, the responses and how they can actually be financially viable. Um, uh, looking at uh, trying to develop also capital investment plans, um, uh, trying to align the projects to uh, the SDGs and try to support municipalities to finance these projects. Um, because all projects are always nice on paper, but what we're trying to do is actually do that step to support uh, municipalities um, in, um, uh, in, in financing and implementing the projects. I'm going uh, step by step uh, regarding our, our, our the Horok projects. Um, so it's mainly based on evidence-based um, analysis, um, spatial and non-spatial analysis. We start with understanding the city. Um, the first thing we did was to uh, talk to the 
community organize workshops, try to uh, uh, um, dig deep uh, into uh, the memories of um, of the community um, who uh, uh, kind of showed um, um, hazard areas, um, how they manage uh, or they cope with it, uh, what are their strategies um, to uh, kind of save their lives when there is a disaster. Um, so we kind of generated uh, kind of a community map of, of hazards and risks. Um, and then comes more the, the uh, comes the more, uh, let's say, sophisticated and technical work uh, of uh, geo-localizing um, uh, risks, but also other uh, components that I'm going to uh, talk about later. In this case, trying to map uh, the the intensity and the um, impacted population uh, by rockfalls, by floodings, by groundwater flooding, by landslides. Um, uh, um, also looking at the uh, uh, also the, the frequency of um, um, of the, the, the risks um, uh, and the, the hazards and also their impact on people and infrastructure, um, which brings us to uh, kind of a combined map of all hazards, which gives you just kind of one layer um, of, of areas where you should build or you should not build um, places, spaces or areas for mitigation, for adaptation and so on. Um, we go even further in kind of mapping architectural heritage and cultural facilities, uh, trying to also to understand the socioeconomic uh, structure or fabric of the city, um, as you see here, uh, looking at the um, uh, a kind of fragmented economic activity or limited economic activity in the city. Looking also at the um, uh, density, existing density, and overlapping it, triangulating it with other aspects such as, such as economic uh, and commercial activity, um, mapping of vacant lands and underutilized lands, um, green areas, public spaces, uh, public facilities, and the catchment areas. So, and these are just a few, there are tons of, of other variables and multi-scholar uh, variables that we, we looked at. Um, but another element that was also very important is to map the, the, the stakeholders and the governance structures um, and uh, try to align, to make sure that we are aligned in terms of strategies um, uh, and, and, and approaches. And then after kind of understanding the city, both spatially and non-spatially, then we move to the identification of issues and, and deficits. Uh, by triangulating all these these um, um, findings, um, um, here, for example, we identified uh, six um, issues. Um, um, one of them is the expansion, is urban expansion in hazard zones that we identified. Um, uh, then uh, the uh, prevalence of underutilized uh, or underused land that gives provides opportunity for redevelopment and regeneration. Um, there is the issue of fragmented urban fabric uh, for many reasons um, and also uh, different um, uh, kind of barriers uh, that, that reduce the connectivity and the permeability within the city because of the river, because of uh, slopes and so on. Um, the issue of, of uh, car dependency and lack of pedestrian linkages uh, that we are showing here because of fragmented road uh, uh, network, um, which also has an impact on, on uh, the vulnerability of, of the population, especially in the case of hazards and the lack of emergency uh, or uh, emergency routes. Um, there's the insufficient utility infrastructure in terms of water, in terms of uh, um, gas and electricity um, that we also identified and you uh, localized um, and the uh, inequitable distribution of public facilities um, that we are highlighting here. And also some of them are also built in hazard areas. Then um, the second phase is planning the city, um, and that's where we start to develop sustainable resp uh, develop, uh, responses um, and define uh, spatial strategies. Um, so uh, these are the six responses that I just uh, mentioned. And what I want to say here is that 
Um, they all include um, eight spatial strategies that we try to uh, uh, that we try to um, uh, kind of integrate in each one of the responses. Um, the growth management strategy, natural and cultural, cultural conservation, uh, basic service provision strategy, urban regeneration, um, housing res resilient streets, hazard mitigation, agriculture and food uh, uh, supply strategy. Um, so the the, the six um, I, I'm going to go with the six responses one by one. Um, so once we have the a map of um, all the hazards, um, uh, uh, hazard prone areas, and we identify also, we overlap them with the built uh, uh, structures. Um, then we identify um, hazard mitigation zones. Um, what you see here within circles, um, and in that case, it happens that there are certain areas that need to be relocated uh, because they are really facing avalanches and, and uh, very strong uh, probability or possibility of uh, um, hazards. So what you see here in red are households that um, we uh, agreed to relocate with the community itself. Um, and that's also a very critical issue uh, that we can talk about uh, later on, how resilience studies are used also for relocation. Um, but we can discuss it later on. Um, and then other areas uh, which are uh, un under threat but not uh, but can, can be solved through uh, mitigation zones. So we accept what is uh, built there, uh, but then we uh, um, add uh, mitigation measures like terracing, um, uh, afforestation uh, to reduce the risk of uh, rock falls and avalanches. Um, what is also very important is the uh, development of a growth restriction boundary uh, that actually restricts any development outside of that line to make sure uh, that the city stays compact um, and, and contained. Um, second response uh, is the regeneration and utilization of underused uh, areas. And these are areas that we identified uh, that are either vacant or underutilized. Um, and uh, um, uh, certain, some of them which are in buildable areas can, uh, can have or can accommodate uh, new development while the yellow ones here uh, which are vacant but cannot be built, uh, uh, we indeed So uh, here is just a question of how do we realize lands and what kind of uh, urban fabric we we opted for. Um, and this is example that just shows you that with the same um, area, we reach the same density, but with different urban forms. Um, and in the case of Khorog, um, we opted for mid-rise, uh, mid-rise, mid-coverage mid or high coverage um, uh, urban fabric, because it gives you the possibility uh, first to uh, minimize the the, the earthquake uh, risks. Um, towers are usually very difficult to uh, to th they are very expensive in terms of structure, but also very difficult to evacuate people in in case of of earthquakes. Um, while the low rise um, high coverage uh, takes a lot of land, um, so the mid rise um, medium coverage. Uh, for us was the optimal one uh, option to optimize to uh, densify while also integrated green uh, spaces and green infrastructure within the built environment um, the third response was the uh, integration of mixed use mixed use development and the uh, improvement of permeability of the urban fabric and here what we see is uh, we actually created uh, uh, this loop, uh, kind of a road that uh, becomes a ring uh, that increases the permeability and connectivity throughout the city um, 
and uh, becomes kind of the spine of, of the town in terms of road network. And then we add connections, uh, bridges, either pedestrian or uh, vehicle uh, bridges to connect both sides of, uh, of the river um, in order also to create a stronger, stronger connection between, uh, between those. Um, and this also uh, gives us the possibility to uh, create diff different e uh, commercial and economic uh, nodes uh, where there would be a concentration of services and concentration of, of activity that is well distributed uh, around the city and not only concentrated in the, in the, uh, in the city center as it is the case now. Response four um, is um, uh, about infrastructure for non-motorized uh, uh, transport and, and public spaces. Um, and as you see, there is also uh, this, this loop that we created um, is also connecting different green spaces to create a network um, of, of open spaces and make them more accessible. Um, um, then also using uh, nature-based solutions uh, for uh, to, to uh, against flooding, um, like flood retention uh, wetlands, um, um, and uh, also uh, measures to reduce the uh, erosion of the river. Um, so in that case, we're actually connecting in road infrastructure, public transport, green spaces. Um, and uh, a well-connected uh, road network, um, all coming together to, to create a, a proper structure um, in the city. What is also important to show here is that these projects are not only uh, random, but we'll try with each proposal, we're trying to uh, test or uh, find out about the impact of that project. Uh, so, for example, here in terms of green spaces, we're try when we put it, we see what are the catch, what is the, what, what are the, uh, what, uh, what is the, the population that is, uh, that that ha that will have access to to that uh, public space, and whether this is the right actually area to have a public space, or whether it it's better to put it somewhere else where it can have a larger catchment area. So these priority nodes are also, there's a whole calculation behind to look at the impact and the catchment area of each infrastructure and each group, uh, uh, green space. Um, when it comes to utilities and water infrastructure, um, just to give you an example with water, um, the, current, the current situation is when, whenever there is a rain or uh, or, or snow when it's freezing, uh, the pipes freeze, uh, um, or there is damage in one pipeline. Since it is a linear uh, system, then you will have, uh, you will, many areas will not have access because there is a problem upstream. And what we try to do is to create loops around districts, uh, kind of circles that even if one area is um, blocked or damaged, the other areas can still have access to water and sewage system. Um, public facilities also um, uh, follow the same strategy, trying to uh, identify the deficit areas. Uh, first, try to understand the impact of each proposed facility and see whether it actually makes sense where we are proposing it or not, um, as we're seeing here, and try to understand the catchment area and its impact and its validity um, and feasibility uh, instead of just finding an, a vacant space and putting a facility. Um, so after these responses, we move to transforming the city. So we, we end up with all these proposals, all these, these, these projects, but at the end you have to uh, prioritize and identify those that actually would uh, make sense. And that has been always a problem uh, for cities because it's the, the choice of projects um, um, is all usually done in a very uh, subjective way based on political agendas, based on finances. Uh, the resources are usually limited, uh, but the projects uh, are, are usually very numerous. So how can you, after you identify the deficit areas, how can you um, 
um, prioritize and choose the projects with the highest impact. And that's kind of the approach that we came up with, um, which we call kind of spatially informed capital investment planning, where we try to connect the, the, the uh, or to study the viability of, of the projects um, uh, based on different criteria and based on uh, uh, on, on multi multi scalar and multi dimensional criteria, um, and here just to give you an example, for any uh, project, um, we have developed a scoring system that kind of uh, differentiates between the, the, each each uh, um, each project and it, its uh, validity. Let's say um, so. The questions are usually these are the main questions, but there are sub sub uh, criteria. Um, it has to do with the infrastructure deficit. So the first map is to see where the deficit is, but then there are other layers to see to 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 look at the uh, the uh, pertinence of the project. Um, does it uh, actually support the spatial development priorities when we're talking about resilience or we're talking about connectivity or permeability? Does it achieve strategic objectives? Um, um, in that case, um, uh, is there a complementarity between different uh, uh, or cluster of of projects, uh, which actually gives them the give us the opportunity to have more transformative impact because they are complementary and close together? Um, is there a component of community participation, and um, does the project have sufficient enablers for implementation, including finance um, um, and uh, political will? Um, and at the end, um, you do this matrix and you do all the scoring, and at the end, it gives you a priority project uh, area map uh, that shows you the areas, the, the, the most priority project that you can actually invest in, like the top 10 or top 20 or the top 100, uh, that you know that they can have a transformative impact and allow you to maybe to also generate income to develop the adjacent uh, areas. Um, and at the end, yeah, it gives you kind of a combined intervention in terms of a master plan that shows all the um, the nodes, all the densifications, all the loops, the roads, uh, the uh, mitigation measures in one map. I will go now into the urban design. I don't know how much time I have, uh, maybe 10 minutes, I don't know. Um, um, so now I'm just trying, we'll try to, to show you how that can be reflected into an urban design scale. And we, uh, we, ba we kind of, we're basing um, our approach on uh, 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 principles that we call My Neighborhood, uh, developed by UN Habitat. Um, and they are based on five main principles, the compact city, the connected city, inclusive city, vibrant city and resilient city, and uh, also looking at different scales, uh, at the um, open space scale, at the street scale, at the um, uh, neighborhood, and at the um, uh, building scale. Um, we, for the city of Horog, we developed uh, two demonstration projects, but before that, we also developed uh, for them um, guidelines, urban design guidelines that are specific to Horog and to mountain cities. Mountain cities are um, very special um, and they are facing different challenges than, than let's say, uh, normal cities in, in, in flatland um, for many reasons. Land is usually scarce, um, there, there, there is the issue of slopes, um, um, there is uh, issues of accessibility um, and risk. Um, so you have to intervene in a different way, and urban design approaches are actually different um, in in, um, in mountain cities. Uh, so uh, just giving you some examples here about some of the important elements that we are uh, uh, identifying as uh, or providing as guidelines. Uh, one of them is actually to promote spatial continuity and compactness. Um, uh, trying to uh, use uh, simple uh, kind of formulas to make sure that development is actually happening to, as a continuity of the existing uh, fabric and not in isolation of it. So we want to keep the structure compact and dense as much as possible. But there's another layer of it is the issue of slopes 
and that's what we identified here that the density and the land use in different uh, slope uh, degrees uh, has uh, is is different and has to be taken in consideration otherwise uh, we we end up in uh, uh, in, in, in difficult uh, in difficult uh, uh, situations of, of hazard prone areas um, and here we showed kind of a map of, of slope degrees and what is the adequate land use um, from uh, high density development to areas that are only suitable for activities such as urban agriculture or green spaces and the red areas for example that are actually not uh, uh, valid for for uh, uh, construction. Um, then all the guidelines about how to build in slopes um, and how to minimize the disturbance of uh, slopes uh, and minimize the damage to buildings uh, because all the uh, the uh, uh, actions of cut and fill can destabilize the uh, the, the slope. Um, also cutting trees. Um, um, or uh, putting in adequate uh, wallings um, can actually have uh, very, very damaging uh, consequences um, on the stability and safety. Um, and these are just a few kind of technical measures um, to support uh, or to increase the resilience of, of buildings and um, in terms of drainage, in terms of uh, structure, um, um, in terms of uh, vegetation and so on. So both soft and uh, technical measures. Um, when you are in mountainous areas also, wind is very important, understanding the dynamics of the wind, um, uh, catabatic wind and anabatic, the, the, uh, between the difference between day and night and the orientation of, of the direction of the wind, um, how to reduce the acceleration of the wind when it's coming down, uh, while also allowing for enough aeration, uh, enough air to go through the, the city to reduce um, uh, uh, the heat island uh, effect. Um, the, the height of buildings is also very important because it can also create uh, downdraft, wind downdrafts, which reduces the comfort on, on the streets and accelerates uh, wind. Um, the orientation of streets and and the the, the setbacks and of, of buildings is very important, especially in mountains areas where it snows and it goes minus twenty in winter. So you need to have uh, to allow for maximum uh, uh, maximum sunlight in winter, um, and it's important actually to think about the 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 frontage of the buildings, their the scale, the orientation of uh, the streets between summer and winter really to maximize uh, to maximize uh, sun exposure. Same thing, how to deal with the vegetation to block wind, but also to allow for sunlight. Um, how to make streets active public spaces, that's important. But what is also crucial in mountain mm -hmm. cities is how to embrace a four season design um, uh, that actually takes into consideration takes into consideration the the the, uh, the different climatic uh, changes throughout the year and keeps public spaces alive even in winter. Uh, here is just an example of uh, these huts or structures, warming structures uh, uh, that that uh, can actually uh, be quite uh, pleasant in winter. Uh, we give guidelines about how to deal uh, how to deal with snow management. Uh, that's also a very crucial element. Uh, in mountainous cities, um, keeping areas where snow can be stored uh, uh, and cleared. Um, also guidelines for how to design sidewalks and uh, safe sidewalks. Uh, design, uh, design recommendations or guidelines for uh, building structures um, that can be resistant to earthquakes. Um, also in a city that actually gets uh, blocked in winter, um, it's always important to have um, on-site decentralized infrastructure uh, that can work in case the central system uh, collapses. And we also provide uh, solutions for uh, water uh, recycling and energy uh, production 
that is integrated with buildings, as you see here, these underground water treat gray water treatment plants uh, that can be actually um, embedded within the, the neighborhood. Um, I can just skip this because there are there are many, um, but uh, just like looking at how urban uh, open spaces can be uh, used uh, to mitigate risk, uh, can be used for for temporary housing or for sheltering or for as parks, as residential areas. How to deal with floods and uh, avoid fault lines. Um, the use of nature-based solutions. I'm, I'm just going quickly because I want to show you the demonstration project. Um, um, how to promote open space development and really integrate integrate green space within the neighborhood uh, as a green infrastructure. Uh, what does mixed use development means um, in terms of uh, land use and the percentage, uh, the adequate percentage to avoid mo uh, monofunctional blocks. Um, promotes uh, neighborhood identity, um, uh, so preserve uh, the vernacular urban patterns. Uh, uh, we go even uh, in more details looking at the roofscape of the city. In mountains areas, that's usually uh, a very important one, public views, et cetera. Um, um, what, what public transport mean in, um, uh, in mountainous areas? Um, we also have to think of public transport system that uh, accommodates and supports other non-motorized uh, development, uh, transportation or mobility. Um, this is just a comparison between the current state um, of public transport system um, uh, in comparison to walkability and its impact um, if we look at the proposal, uh, uh, the proposed structure um, looking here at five, 10 and 15 minute walking distances. Multimodal streets, I just skipped, sorry, because I know I'm over time. Um, pedestrian accessibility in, in slopes is also extremely important. And there we have to be very innovative in uh, providing a, a, a adequate accessibility. Um, so, um, so after all these um, prioritization and all the process that that I explained, uh, uh, we identified two sites, uh, these two, uh, to uh, as demonstration projects to see how we can regenerate um, uh, vacant lands or underutilized land, uh, trying to integrate um, some of these concepts and guidelines and uh, give it to the city as maybe one way to, to approach uh, resilience. So um, uh, the map of public facilities that is um, uh, based also on this spatially informed capital investment planning gives us specific um, uh, catalog, let's say, or program um, uh, looking at the deficits, uh, deficit areas in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, public facilities. And these are the ones that we can uh, integrate. And the site that I'm talking about now is one of the, is the first site, which is this part. It's an old industrial, it's an old industrial site. Um, it looks exactly like you see now in the picture. Uh, most of the buildings are, are empty. There are a couple of houses. There are remaining infrastructure, uh, remaining structures uh, from previous industry. A uh, bit of topography, two levels that we also had to integrate um, in um, in the design. Um, um, but then we had workshops with the community looking at uh, their their vision and their needs, um, trying to also the analysis of uh, blue and green networks around the city. Uh, around the, the site, uh, the analysis of the topography and also analysis of uh, interesting views that we can uh, uh, that we can uh, integrate um, a view towards the mountains or towards the river. Uh, the connectivity analysis, how our site can be connected to that loop um, and from there to other green public spaces, the complementarity between our projects and surrounding projects. Um, this is an important thing uh, aspect in the project because we always try to 
triangulate and see what is actually the connection and complementarity between what we are proposing uh, in terms of projects and try to avoid also conflicts. Um, um, and this is kind of the master plan. So the idea was um, actually to develop um, uh, a techno park uh, for a clean and innovative uh, 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 industry for the youth, um, IT, um, IT industry and clean industry. Um, but it's kind of a multifunctional uh, techno park uh, with, with uh, active frontages with other facilities, um, cafes, restaurants, to keep it active even outside of working hours. Um, then this is also was used as a site for the relocation of, of the, uh, as a relocation site for the, the areas that I showed you in the very beginning. Um, so we also had to uh, cater for around uh, 800 people uh, try to fit them into uh, different housing typologies um, and integrate that in a green infrastructure, try to bring in also public facilities, um, uh, the re renovation of existing, of some of the existing structures um, into uh, a greenhouse that you see here uh, for food security and food production um, and so on. So I just go um uh quickly uh there there's a slope here a steep slope um that we uh integrate in the afforestation uh project to stabilize it but we also integrate it um as a um as a, as a park uh with a access from the neighborhood this is just kind of a bird view uh picture that shows you the greenhouse uh with sports field uh, uh downstairs um, the techno park and the housing development. Um, this is kind of the proposed mobility pattern. Uh, we're trying to uh, guarantee ac access also in, in case of emergency and disaster um, to public facilities, which are also used as safe havens. Uh, here in that case, a school um, um, and also kind of connect uh, to connect uh, the mobility structure uh, to the existing one um, in a kind of a more sustainable way. So most of this, the, the paths here are either shared spaces uh, with limited vehicular mobility or pedestrian walkways. Um, and then the accessibility through from the slope to the uh, parallel streets was also extremely important. Uh, this is a picture that shows the integration of the topography and the different levels into the sites. Um, um, also the use of topography to integrate um, uh, parking. Uh, we're trying to minimize also parking on the street and most of the parking here is shared between the community and offices and shops um, uh, as an underground parking. Um, green infrastructure is very important because we have here a uh, water underground water treatment plant for the neighborhood, which actually can be used for the irrigation of, uh, we're talking about gray water, so it will be used for the irrigation of green spaces and urban farming activities. But beyond that, we also um, have um, ample possibilities for recreation, uh, multifunctional green spaces for, for farming, for leisure uh, and playgrounds um, and so on. Uh, this is, um, I showed you this before, kind of the integrated green system solutions uh, for, uh, water for water treatment uh, in case, uh, especially in case the, the uh, central system collapses. Um, for the open spaces, what we try to do here is also to save uh, as much as possible in terms of uh, the existing structures to give an identity to, to the site um, uh, and also create uh, these spaces for encounter and for the community together and, and manage the site. So uh, I talked about the access to the ramp uh, before, um, which is kind of vegetated and stabilized. Um, there is an existing uh, ramp, uh, steel ramp, that can be converted also and, uh, and, and 
um, kind of used as a bridge to to reach the ramp and from there can go all the way up to the main to the main street um, there are other structures that are uh, standing that can be uh, where where nice and attractive public spaces can be um, uh, can be added and they are also used these open spaces are used as um, let's say meeting meeting points um, in case of an earthquake um, so they are usually within within the urban fabric uh, and people can gather here um, in terms of uh, in case of an earthquake but otherwise they are used as a very convenient and pleasant space with a cafe with a community park here with a kindergarten so it's quite compact and and nice uh, public uh, public spaces um, and these are the shared space with very minimal car car use um, also the use of uh, existing structures here these uh, uh, citerns uh, um, that can be used to store the uh, the water that is treated um, in the uh, water treatment plant um, and 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 can be used also for as I said for irrigation or for agriculture use. Um, very important when we're talking about uh, inclusivity, uh, what we try to do also here is to, sh to um, develop or provide different housing typologies uh, for uh, dif different, um, let's say, income, income groups. Um, so we have, uh, the, um, uh, we have apartment buildings, um, as you see here, um, uh, we have multifamily houses um, that are actually also inspired from the Pamiri architecture and can give a new model, a denser model um, and alternative to single houses uh, or single house buildings. And then we also have few single house, house building. Um, uh, so we have three, three typologies um, of houses um, of, that actually go from affordable to uh, none of to to uh, slightly more um, more more one family oriented let's say can be expensive um, um, yeah and this is just the second site I will not go through it but it's just um, uh, it it followed a similar approach. Um, uh, the only difference is that this one um, is on the river uh, front um, and also it includes some mitigation projects uh, uh, and the development of the river uh, front promenade. Um, but the, the idea is the same. It's another relocation project uh, with a density that reaches 250, 260 uh, a person per hectare. What is also important for both projects is that we also look at the number of jobs we are creating through the integration of mixed use development. So all the, um, the commercial activities and uh, facilities that we are bringing in, we, we, uh, we calculate how much uh, job opportunities they can provide. And of course, the opportunities for economic development for, um, uh, for the uh, pop local population. Sorry for taking too much of your time. I think I exceeded my time by like 10, 15 minutes. Um, but uh, yeah, I uh, I think I'm I'm done, and I'm open for your uh, for your questions. Thank you, sir. So uh, we'll keep the questions to the last, uh, so that we won't uh, delay. We won't create a delay in the session. So uh, yeah. I hope. Uh, you're okay with that your time for sure me. yeah so uh thank you uh, Dr. uh mr yasin for introducing us to your uh, project on integrated spatial plan for environmental and social economic resilience in Korok, uh, Tajikistan, uh, wherein you have helped uh, the audience also once again understand the concept of what is urban resilience the challenges that we are faced with and then taking us through your project so thank you very much, sir, for the same. Now we move on to our second speaker for the day. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Srinivas Dakiti. Uh, sir, you're there. Yes. So I take this opportunity to uh, introduce our second speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Srinivas Dakiti. Sir is uh, uh, working as an assistant professor in the School of Planning and Architecture with Ayurveda. 
He is an architect planner with more than 25 years of experience in academics, research, and industry in the field of architecture and planning. He has completed his Bachelor of Architecture from uh, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Techn uh, Technological University in Hyderabad, India, and Master of Planning with Specialization in Housing from School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi, India. He has uh, received his uh, doctoral degree from School of Planning and Architecture, Vijayawada, on the topic on uh, impact of occupation on rural housing. Uh, his broad areas of interest is culture, rural housing, vernacular architecture, adaptive reuse, etc. Uh, he was also a member of many international projects uh, like the Building Inclusive Urban Communities, a project funded by Erasmus by European Union. He has won uh, received prestigious awards like the Dr. Sarvapilli Radhakrishnan Best Faculty Award in 2021 and Indo and uh, Asian Distinguished Architect Award in 2020. He is co-author for two books with titles uh, Design of Housing Options for Different Agroclimatic Zones in Coastal Areas of Andhra Pradesh, India, and Documentation of Traditional Housing Typology for the Poor based on building material usage in the state of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, and he has published more than 50 research papers. Uh, so with that, uh, I welcome Sir for this uh, the second session in our book workshop on building inclusive cities. Sir, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just sharing my screen. Please check it out. So that... yes. Can you see the screen? Uh, yes, sir. So yes, I'll switch off my video so that uh, it will be more clear. Okay. Yeah, is it clear, right? Your screen is clear, sir. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, good evening and after a wonderful presentation by Mr. Asin with a uh, pretty good example about uh, uh, urban resilience. So I think my presentation would have been uh, before uh, uh, Mr. Asin's presentation because my presentation is going to be more on macro level uh, uh, with uh, this contents, which talks about introduction, need for urban resilience, role of urban resilience, principles, and impact of uh, climate change, case studies, and strategies uh, related to the urban form, uh, public participation, role of technology, and a few conclusive remarks. So. Uh, thank you, Mr. Essin, for the wonderful presentation and uh, letting us through uh, the journey of your project. And uh, according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, so urban resilience is the ability of an urban system to absorb, recover, and prepare for future impacts. So we have already discussed about uh, the definition and how it comes through in our previous presentation also. So it is a power that cities have to adapt or quickly transform their functions in the face of a disturbance that limits their possibilities. And these cities can respond and reinvent themselves when in adversity. So as our role becomes uh, more interconnected and complex, it is crucial that we consider the role of urban design in fostering resilience. So by creating cities that are adaptable, sustainable, and equitable, we can ensure that they remain vibrant and livable for the generations to come. So resilience is basically a combination of absorbing disturbances and achieving a balance, self-reorganization, and increasing the capacity for learning and adaptability. So now, so if you check with the image on the right-hand side, where we could find like uh, what, uh, what are the components and what are the aspects which we uh, come across when we are discussing about urban resilience like persistence, adaptability and transformability. And more or less, we have seen these aspects uh, which have been addressed in previous presentation of Mr. Asin. So that's wonderful to look how these aspects were uh, that tried to incorporate these aspects in our uh, Rai project. So, <clears throat> So these are the four important uh, components or aspects which becomes important 
uh, while dealing with urban resilience. So economy, where we discuss about uh, GDP growth rate, unemployment, number of startups and business failures, age and gender of employed working population, etc. When we talk about environment, like we have uh, population density, uh, which is one of the important aspects, then accessibility to green areas, the percentage of built up areas and brownfield development and percentage of citizens near open spaces, etc. And also the percentage of new development near the transit locations. We also talk about public administration where revenue resources, number of community organizations, public sector officials and subnational government. And taking the food aspect of society where the migration and the poverty levels, the household income and percentage of population living 500 meters from the surfaces, etc. So now, uh, at a historical moment when industrialization and urbanization are continuing at a fast and predatory pace, we need to design and produce spaces that can adapt to new realities. And based on this need, concepts that can guide the transformation and production of future cities emerge and uh, modern urban lifestyles must adapt to new environmental, spatial, climatic or social demands. So the global warming and all other world crises point to the need to rethink the ways of life in society, both for the future and the present. So since they are established as a dominant way of inhabiting, many cities have dealt with conflicting events, showing that it is necessary to think of cities that can regenerate in natural, economic and political conflicts. So when we talk about urban design, which plays a crucial role in resilience development by creating sustainable and adaptable infrastructure. So the design of buildings, streets and public spaces can influence how well a city can withstand and recover from disasters such as floods, earthquakes and extreme weather events. So by incorporating features such as green roofs, I'm just giving you little examples like permeable movement and rain gardens. The, these designers can help mitigate the impact of climate change on cities. So additionally, designing buildings with flexible layouts and adaptable systems can make them more resilient to the changing conditions. So urban design can also promote social cohesion and equity, which are important factors in building resilience. So by performing land zoning and management of urban growth to avoid or exacerbating the resilience issues and identification of suitable land for future development, taking into consideration of how low income groups can access to suitable land. And uh, we also have to execute risk aware planning, design and implementation of new buildings neighborhoods and infrastructure using innovative or existing traditional techniques as applicable. So, uh, so this aspect of talking about uh, existing and traditional techniques has uh, becomes very important because there's, there's a lot of things which we can learn from the past. We can learn from the past techniques, traditional techniques and innovative techniques which were used centuries and centuries ago and which was successful. I think those are the great lessons for us to learn in future uh, and can adapt these methods of making our cities more sustainable. So conduct systematic and specific vulnerable mapping, like address the needs of informal settlements, which includes basic infrastructure deficits such as water, drainage and sanitation, and also to improve infrastructure for resiliency to potential hazards incorporating appropriate retrofitting of prevention measures. So, and also develop and implement appropriate building codes and guidelines for heritage structures. So the principles of resilient uh, urban design, so we can uh, focus energy and uh, resources on conserving, enhancing and creating strong vibrant places, which are a significant component of the neighborhood structure and of the community's identity and also conserve and enhance the health of natural systems which includes climate and areas of environmental significance and manage the impacts of climate change enhance the effectiveness and uh, efficiency and safety of the technical and industrial systems and processes including their manufacturing transportation 
communications and construction infrastructure and systems to increase their energy efficiency and reduce their environmental footprint. So we'll grow and produce the resources that need in close proximity to 200 kilometer radius and will require the active participation of community members, which was being discussed in the previous presentation at all scales in the development plans, plan and design redundancy and durability of their life safety and critical infrastructure systems and develop building types and urban forms with reduced servicing costs and reduced environmental footprints. So when we are uh, talking about uh, the, these aspects, one important aspect is to prioritize walking as a preferred mode of travel and as a defining component of healthy quality of life and develop in a way that is transit supportive, embrace density, diversity, and mix users, users, building types in public spaces, and provide the needs of daily living within walking distance of 100 meter radius. So now, uh, impact of climate change on urban resilience. So as temperature rises, cities will face more frequent extreme weather events such as floods and heat waves, which can cause significant damage to infrastructure and disrupt daily life. So I think now we are seeing the extreme uh, conditions in Delhi where we have floods which were happening for a couple of days. This is the news which we are seeing. And in addition, climate change will exacerbate existing social and economic inequalities, making it even more important for urban designers to consider the needs of all residents in their plans. And this means designing public spaces that are accessible to everyone, creating affordable housing options and developing transportation systems that are reliable and efficient. So by taking these factors into account, urban designers can help create more resilient communities that are better equipped to withstand the impacts of climate change. And uh, if you talk about this urban management and design strategies, which are related to heat waves and uh, uh, UHI effect. So modification or design of physical infrastructure. So where we could uh, talk about more about uh, improvement of build environment performance, which includes energy and water efficiency measures like uh, thermal insulation or system based heating and cooling that take advantage of uh, cooling towers or distribution uh, to save energy and reduce sensible heat discharge. And also design of urban air flows and wind paths to improve ventilation in summer or hot climates. So for example, we try to plan low rise buildings and linear parks, taking advantage of dominant winds near static water bodies. And also application of uh, passive cooling strategies uh, to buildings that their surroundings, example, uh, increasing uh, albedo through pool roofs and pavements, thermal insulation, shading, orientation, and natural ventilation. The application of urban heat stress resistant design like uh, urban heat wave vulnerability maps and management strategies like NDS and reduced impervious surfaces, etc. And uh, Governance, communication, public en engagement. We can talk about creation of local heat health action plans or active engagement in regional or national ones and use of incentives and disincentives like additional subsidies, taxes on water use and government provision and demonstration uh, on green building and public parks and application of regulations such as mandatory minimum green space ratios which has to be introduced in local planning regulations to maximize the green space between the buildings. So we also have uh, gray infrastructure like reservoirs, uh, et cetera, which have to be uh, like drainage networks, culverts, regulation of rivers and introduction of flood defenses such as bunds, embankments and uh, diversionary channels and green and blue infrastructure where use of interception and uh, permeable surfaces using low impact development techniques. And when you talk about governance, again, exploration of local scale adaptation strategies and regulation and uh, flood forecasting, emergency planning and response and uh, post flood recovery plans and information, uh, the inf provision on flood related risks and responses 
where we need emergency hotlines and online information and uh, promoting compliance with uh, current regulations such as flood proofing domestic oil tanks etc and now we also have this uh, modification design on physical infrastructure like open safe urban areas as earthquake evacuation shelters and development of evacuation routes and uh, safe gathering spaces and retrofitting uh, disaster resistant buildings and new developments for relocation of a displaced population. And we discuss about this, so the role of governance and etc., where we need to uh, understand about improving prediction methods and scenario-wise thinking approaches to seismic vulnerability assessments uh, while considering uh, cascading effects, then provision of uh, updated information on buildings use and state example uh, uh, like when it has been constructed and uh, like uh, prediction of structural resistance to earthquakes and other potential vulnerabilities such as shade walls with other buildings or narrow access routes for evacuation and rescue so again a few aspects like uh, critical infrastructure overhauls and then uh, power infrastructure uh, underground replacing vulnerable vegetation and mature vegetation away from transport infrastructure and it is better to have uh, be prepared with the medical information systems inventories plans and protocols and promotion of emergency drills for various hazards so most of the countries are uh, uh, handling this and even uh, development of clear communication emergency response plan for different types sizes and the proximities of disasters so this uh, so, for example, urban resilience strategies related to cities uh, with different uh, geographical locations. For example, if you take uh, Chennai or Vishakhapatnam or uh, Panaji as a city type where coastal urban areas are there, and we have sea level rise and coastal erosion and marine submersion as a challenges. And local urban design and management strategies could be like uh, building gray infrastructure and hard constrictions like seawalls and repraps and to hold coastal lines from hazards. And then uh, uh, try to manage retreat of activities and population to areas not exposed to hazards. Example further from the coastline. Uh, and development of adaption plans that give land back to water, example, floating house or water city councils, which is expensive, which have been uh this approach has been adopted by few people but which is uh, a very huge challenge and uh, expensive task then we have a few cities inland cities like nagpur bangalore etc where the challenge is flooding again and development of floodplain storage measures example periodically uh, floodable open spaces to storage to store large volumes of in channel flows uh, so the, this leads to flood risk adaptation. Then low impact development to manage stormwater runoff and promotion of resilient planting design. Uh, then we have ecosystems and species stress and vulnerability where increased landscape connectivity like creation and preservation of green corridors and uh, stepping stones. Then when heat is as a challenge like use of urban cooling solutions like vegetation, shading of impervious services and building green roofs and cool pavements and uh, multimodal mobility where we have smart growth and nodal development strategies like facilitation of pedestrian and oriented and transit experience i understand like most of these are long-term strategies etc but uh, uh, <clears throat> then we have dry cities like jodhpur jaisalmer where we have water scarcity and we have water sensitive urban design example, water efficiency devices and garden irrigation regulations, then on-demand water systems like using sensors to save, recycle and uh, upcycle up water. So urban resilience measures in, so I've just thought a few examples, which on a brief, like macro level examples, what uh, measures have been uh, taken care by various uh, uh, cities across the world uh, not uh, not in detail but uh, one slide per city just to have an understanding so the city of newark has faced numerous challenges like hurricane sandy in 2012 uh, which caused significant damage to the city's uh, infrastructure and economy in response new york city has implemented a range of innovative solutions 
one key strategy was uh, the development of green infrastructure such as green roofs rain gardens which help absorb storm water uh, and prevent flooding and the city has also invested on uh, improving its transportation infrastructure including expanding public transit and creating bike lanes to reduce congestion and provide alternative uh, modes of transportation in case of emergencies. So actually New York City has implemented zoning regulations to promote mixed development and increase access to essential services such as healthcare and uh, grocery stores in un underserved communities. So now uh, if you take uh, Tokyo as an example from earthquakes to typhoons, typhoons, the city of Tokyo has experienced its fair share of challenges. So, so one such strategy is the creation of uh, uh, green spaces throughout the city. And then uh, these spaces not only provide a much needed respite from the concrete jungle, but also served as natural buffers against flooding and other disasters. So additionally, Tokyo building uh, codes are some of the strictest in the world, ensuring that structures can withstand even the strongest uh, earthquakes. Uh, so urban resilience measures in Rotterdam. So one of the key strategies implemented by the city of Rotterdam, a city in Netherlands, is the creation of multifunctional public spaces that can serve as both recreational areas and flood storage uh, during extreme weather events. So additionally, Rotterdam has uh, invested in innovative technologies such as smart water management systems and floating buildings to adapt to changing environmental conditions. So these efforts have not only increased the city's resilience, but also improved its livability and attractiveness for residents and visitors alike. So uh, in uh, Seville in Europe, uh, uh, its answer to this forecast is Katija Kana, the 5 million euro pilot project that aims to lower average temperatures around one street by 10 degrees. So the project 80% financed by European Union funds and scheduled to be completed in October is led by several city hall and backed by institutions, including the University Day Savita. So to lower average temperatures, engineers have come up with a way to replicate the ancient Persian technology of the canons. So these systems developed over a thousand years ago consists of building underground canals that carry water across large area that needs to be cooled. So vertical shafts pierced along the canal take air underground to the surface, lowering temperatures above ground. So this is a very good example where we could learn from the past, the traditional methods, traditional techniques and innovative methods which are used in the past could always be lessons for us to adopt them in a uh, modern uh, building uh, modern cities, uh, which could be more uh, sustainable. So uh, the Sydney streets are not only provide beautiful shade, color, habitat, they're also a legacy for the future generation. So this plan provides a coordinated and strategic approach to future planting and ensures the streets provide a green and resilient future. So urban resilience strategies related to urban form, like uh, when you have compactness or high densities, so local urban design and management strategies could be like introduction to mixed land use, improve accessibility, planned and well-protected green spaces and connectivity. And uh, the benefit could be lower travel demand and associated energy consumption with climate change mitigation, better air quality and promotion of active and public transportation. So for, for energy and water demand, like promotion of compact urban development coupled with development of efficient large scale community energy systems like district energy and cooling systems. And then we have environmental and health benefit like reduction of energy and water demand, optimization or efficiency of infrastructure layout and maintenance. And we have transportation network routes and modes is one of the challenges and uh, the strategies could be like identification of most critical links and efficiency itineraries in case of emergency and promotion of public transportation uh, infrastructure throughout the city 
and promotion of transport infrastructure for different types of vehicles and users, and promotion of access to multi multiple modes of transportation throughout the city, especially in vulnerable neighborhoods. So now we talk about uh, reduction of private vehicle dependence, which is one of the most important uh, aspect uh, where promotion of walkability through development of walkable and cyclable streets and encouraging bike sharing programs and tools to assess it. And promotion of transit oriented developments and innovations like uh, electrifying transport and trackless trams and uh, promotion of long term sanitation practices in public transportation beyond pandemic outbreaks and temporary road closures and street redesign to enhance public space for people like wider sidewalks and large cycling lanes cycle paths and pedestrianization and this has been uh, a huge job uh, the research is going on these aspects so then we have public participation which is one of the key role uh, because ultimately uh, either the urban designers or the architects or the urban planners we uh, end up designing for a particular user it could be a city town or a building etc so where the people who use them and the people who particip uh, the participation of these public becomes uh, a major important aspect like involves community engagement and uh, understand their needs and concerns and take ideas from them then integration of public input and design and ensuring public participation balancing interests and priorities decision and benefit to community as a whole and with uh, with involving residents in the design process achieving social equality and uh, commitment and uh, collaboration so uh, role of technology in resilience development we need to analyze and predict the potential risks where technology plays a major role and there's a huge advancement in the science and technology where uh, each and every day we are doing you know, we are uh, we are uh, uh, we, uh, we are trying to look at uh, lots and lots of numerous advanced techniques uh, which are coming up which could help us in uh, uh, which could help us in uh, providing uh, uh, better solutions uh, and uh, to uh, uh, for, for, for solving these challenges, etc., and enables decision resilient uh, to disasters, better co coordination and communications during emergencies, and social media platform to disseminate information swiftly. And then we have uh, just try to. Uh, uh, based on this uh, macro level understanding i just want to give a conclusive remarks that cities are prototypical complex adaptive systems that are faced with a merit disturbances most of which are unforeseen and unpredictable and urban design principles are increasingly influenced by ecological ideas of heterogeneity non-linearity hierarchy and multiple stable states and ecological resilience has emerged as a major approach to understanding and managing social ecological systems, including urban design. And this theory suggests that to, sus to design sustainable cities, our emphasis should be on creating and maintaining urban resilience. The ability of a city to persist without changing its basic structure, function and identity. And what underlies a truly resilient city is not how stable it has appeared, but whether it can withstand an unforeseen shock that would fundamentally alter or erase the city's identity. So for cities to be sustainable, urban design must explicitly account for the influence of both internal and external changes now and in the future. So uh, the most important aspect which uh, uh, everyone agree is like uh, the, the migration or the urbanization, which is becoming a major aspect. So. Uh, why don't simultaneously why don't we try to develop uh, the rural uh, uh, the rural component of any part of the world so any any which belongs to any country so that if the rural areas become more self-sustained so there is less of migration so people can also work through another angle of trying to improve or better make make better uh, employment opportunities and make a, a rich rural uh, uh, bill forms so that uh, the risk of uh, the risk of uh, uh, future risks which are going to happen for any cities or emerging uh, any cities or towns could be uh, reduced. So this is one uh, uh, the point which I would like to stress on is trying to 
reduce how we can reduce the migration so which is actually a challenge in every country or it's a major challenge for the whole world so how could this happen so any major strategies which we could try to so it is like prevention is better than cure so rather than trying to bring a lot of people into the city and town and then trying to uh, adopt the measures then why don't we try to make uh, uh, make this solution in a uh, and try to take this as one point uh, in the future. Uh, uh, so thank you. I think I'll just end up. I've moved fast because I thought of the shortage of time, and uh, so we are. So after the discussion, we can complete uh, before five. Rajiv, it's to you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I hope uh, the audience, uh, and I'm happy, means, uh, I do understand that the audience would have got a lot many points from both of the discussions that we had today. Uh, now the floor is open for questions. Uh, we did have few participants uh, eagerly ready to post questions to the first speaker, which I had to stop uh, because we were running a bit late. Uh, so now it's the time that you, the audience can post questions to both the speakers. The floor is open. Anyone? Uh, I think at that time, uh, if I think, uh, Mr. Essen, like, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation, actually. I mean, it was like uh, going through a project in detail and all. So it was, uh, it was really, uh, we are happy to see your project because that gives a different dimension when we actually know what is happening exactly because we talk about uh, uh, most of these aspects uh, at a larger scale macro level and we don't know what exactly is happening in the uh, grassroots etc thank you thank you for your wonderful presentation thank you very much so uh, audience, uh, any uh, we have our students, faculty all joining us. So anyone, any questions? You can even, uh, if your uh, audio or your mics are not working, you can even type it in the chat box. Uh, on your behalf, I can post the, post the questions to the speakers. Hello, Rajiv. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Yasin. This is uh, Dr. Karthik from SK Vijayawada. I'm also an urban designer. Uh, so it's not a question from my side, but I really loved your presentation because the scale at which uh, the urban resilience has to be read. So I think the documentation started from there. And then it really went on uh, to a micro scale, I mean, uh, to the level of a unit. So that was quite interesting. I really enjoyed the presentation. And, and also the scale of development, uh, um, I really felt it, it actually merged with the surrounding landscape and the surrounding urban character, which it seemed very, very interesting, unless otherwise in other projects, we usually see that uh, these urban design schemes are more imposing rather than uh, being more inclusive. Thank you, Mr. Yasin. Yeah, no, thank you very much for your comments. Yeah. And I have a uh, good presentation now, uh, Mr. Srinivas, too. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Uh, we have. Uh, Can I? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Yasin, uh, your presentation was a feast to the eye. It was fantastic the way it was composed. I just have a query. Uh, I could see a lot of greenery on the proposals that were shown. Uh, is the landscape of uh, Kazakhstan such to encourage? I mean, uh, does is it that easy for trees to grow in that place? Yes, um, the, the the weather is is quite extreme. It gets uh, really cold and snowy in winter, uh, so snow can be two meters high. 
but uh, spring and summer is quite nice and, and quite green. So there are a lot of trees um, and a lot of spaces that actually people are using for agriculture even within the neighborhoods. There's a huge food security uh, uh, issue. As I said, whenever there is uh, there also a history of conflict, it's a border town to Afghanistan. So uh, they've been, the, the borders are also closed and there are um, also, there used to be cross border exchanges and markets and economy going from both ways, but uh, that also had an impact on, on the flow of food and of, of uh, goods. Um, so people are actually using these spaces whenever possible to grow their food in their gardens in public spaces. Um, and that's something we picked up and we tried to also include in our, uh, uh, in our projects to really have that strong nexus between food, water, and energy. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, well, thank you. Thank you, sir. And I think I will be uh, uh, interested uh, to know, kind of follow up on your further presentations about how, how this project goes forward. I mean, um, whether uh, this is going to be practically done because uh, that would be really a successful thing and a model, I think, considering the kind of landscape that is being shown in real because that look very harsh, the mountains and the ruggedness of the uh, current landscape. And uh, uh, Dr. Srinivas, your presentation was very uh, interesting from the point of view, especially that Mm, I'll be interested to see how we uh, uh, adapt to, uh, I mean, how resilient we are in whichever context we are, say whether it is Vijayawada or Chennai, as compared to your presentation, which showed uh, the resilience of, uh, of New York. So I think that's something which will be now uh, interesting for us to see. So thank you. Thank you both of you for the wonderful presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Maybe I jump on on uh, your your last question and then uh, about, about the implementation. So now we are at the end of of the project, uh, and um, so we're delivering it. We did, it's actually in collaboration with Aga Khan, which all with, they're also doing a great job uh, in Khorok, um, and they're also investing a lot in uh, strengthening the resilience of the city in terms of monitoring and in terms of uh, uh, kind of also building infrastructure and so on. So what we try to, to do and one big part and I think a very important part of the project was what we call the spatially informed capital investment planning. And with that we're really targeting the, the, the institutions and the government and the municipalities saying well you guys, we know that the resources are very limited and we need to prioritize. Um, and uh, this, this plan, this master plan, or this approach that we provided is actually a way to regulate the urban development and also attract investors. So when they know that there are actually, when an investor comes and knows that they are investing in a safe area, um, in an attractive city, uh, um, that actually can 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 attract and contribute to the development of the area so what we tried to do as i said with the capital investment planning is to create this priority list and create something that we call the um, uh, investment cards so we we have a few investment cards <laughs> with specific priority projects with the the budget with the impact positive impact, negative impact, um, and the influence on, on the city. And with these cards, yeah, this is what we have. These are our priority projects. That's, uh, and also we do assess the, um, the financial capacity and uh, the taxation within the municipality. So we also try to see the resources and give the municipality these cards that they can actually um, give or discuss uh, with with investors to attract them and say, well, 
these things are reliable, this, this is evidence-based, um, this is in stored uh, and, and safeguarded by regulations. Um, and it also goes with all the investment in infrastructure um, that we was just mentioned in terms of walkability, in terms of mixed use, um, and so on. So we're pushing towards that implement implementability of the project as the core element. Uh, uh, the project only has value if it's implemented, and that's something we are preaching for uh, at the Urban Lab. Extremely well said, sir. A project has validity uh, only when it is it has implementability, and I think it would be encouraging for many many people, and it would be a ray of hope for many people or uh, in many situations. And my best wishes for this to be a great success and be a role model. Thank you, thank you very much. I think it's the issue with the international development in general because. Uh, I think in many places that we visited, people are fed up with with experts coming in, giving pro and, and giving nice pictures and whatever, um, and that and they lose the trust actually both in the institutions and in the experts and the international development. So it's just also talking about social resilience <laughs> and and uh, having that trust between. Uh, between us urban planners and the community and institutions is extremely important. Yes, so yeah. yes, I totally agree with you on uh, this aspect and taking that forward also, yes, socio-ecological resilience is something that everyone should be focusing on. So uh, uh, we have any more questions from the audience, anyone? Any student would like to pose any question? I know there are, there's also the dark side of, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. If there's a question, go ahead, please. No, uh, if there are no questions, uh, I think, uh, thank you uh, very much for joining us, uh, Mr. Yasin. And uh, it's a uh, very uh, elaborate, your presentation is uh, very elaborative and informative and also linking with the uh, live project and uh, we are exposed to uh, even a uh, real world scenario. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. And the second speaker, Dr. Sheen was, he highlighted the role of urban design in uh, urban resilient development and also land use management at the core of the urban resilience and also certain climate aspects also he talked about and then uh, highlighted certain principles and uh, strategies, important strategies across the uh, world. And it is also uh, a informative presentation. So I thank both the uh, external speakers for joining us today to uh, make this uh, workshop file uh, uh, more informative and also beneficial to the audience uh, today. Thank you once again. Uh, I would like to, uh, sir, uh, director, sir, uh, you want to share a few words, sir? Sir, Ramesh, sir? So I think. Uh, I think he might be in some meeting or some meeting. Yes, I think, uh, sir, I mean, sir, uh, sir, you, you would like to share some words, few words. Sir, you are, you are yeah, it's an excellent uh, knowledge. What I have also learned so many things from both the presenters. Really, it's uh, amazing and it's a uh, very uh, knowledgeable. I think I really enjoy it. And then I have got a lot of uh, learnings from this particular program. Thank you very much to the both the speakers. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. So, shall we conclude the session, sir? Yeah. 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 Rajiv, you can uh, give a vote of thanks. Thank you. Uh, so, on behalf of SK Vijayawada, I take this opportunity to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, first of all, I 
Uh, we thank our respected speakers for the day, Mr. Yasin, uh, urban planning expert at UN Habitat Kenya, and uh, Dr. Srinivas, uh, assistant professor, Department of Architecture, uh, SPA with Ewada. And uh, then uh, the main person who has taken the initiative for such discussions, we have our chief, chief patron. Uh, we would like to thank Professor Dr. Ramesh for spearheading this uh, workshop series. And the coordinators, Dr. Radhanarayan, Ion, sir, uh, Dr. Ion, and Dr. Janmajay Gupta. Uh, in addition, I would like to wholeheartedly thank our distinguished uh, experts from United Nations uh, Human Settlements Program, Ms. Faru Dagarwal, uh, the Country Program Manager, and Ms. Uh, Mansi Sastrev, the Senior Urban Planner. And all deans, HODs, uh, faculty members, and dear students from SP Vijayawada for making this fifth workshop on uh, titled uh, on the theme Urban Design and Resilient Development in the workshop series on Building Inclusive Cities for Resilient and Sustainable Future uh, Success. So thank you very much all for joining us and have a pleasant evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ms. Mansi. Thank you, Mansi.